The hypothalamus. What is it and where do you find it? Now, no cheating. You can't just go and look it up. Although obviously I did. So for the fellow non-scientists out there, apparently it's an almond side structure deep inside the brain. It's a kind of smart control system, ensuring that the body remains in a stable state. Now, that's the bluffer's guide anyway. Luckily, here at Huawei's annual ICT competition final, and speaking on a Women in Tech panel, there's someone who actually knows what she's talking about when it comes to this subject, Professor Xu Hong. She's studying the precise role of the hypothalamus in governing innate animal behaviour. Don't worry, I know what you're going to ask. Innate animal behaviors are behaviors that emerge without training. They spontaneously emerge. So a good example is that people, if you have pets, like cats and dogs, you can see them do like really complex behavior, like chasing the ball, or like say hiding. And those are behaviors that are innate because it's um, in their, within their genetics, all these spontaneous, without the, like, you know, you have to train them, like, extensively. So it's unthinking, almost, automatic behavior? Uh, so, yes. Uh, I would not say unthinking, but it's automatic, right. in a way. It's spontaneous emerging. So the opposite would be, like, say, us learning playing piano. Right. And then right. You, you need, like, hours and hours of training. So um, does not mean that the animal cannot learn by getting better at innate behavior, it's just the emergence of that behavior are spontaneous. So what's the work you're doing in this field then around innate animal behavior? What we are studying basically are the neural substrates. Uh, how your brain control the behavior? Why the behaviors are occurring? Mm. Say uh, the mice is see the cat is start to run away. How does the mice know it's a cat? How does it know the cat might eat me? How, why does it run away? What are the neurons in the brain? Which part of the brain is activated that sort of uh, uh, directs this sort of behavior? Those are the questions that we are interested in answering. So you're not looking at whether behaviors are high, hardwired. You're more looking at what is it that which cell in the hypothalamus is governing that behavior and directing that behavior. Yes, the weather part is embedded in sort of the answer. Right? I'm yes. sort of assumed it's hardwired, which is why I can go into the brain and find the neuron that's controlling the behaviors. And so what's been progress so far? What have you learned? My specific area as a field, like we've found like, you know, the neuron that's making the mice afraid, the neurons making the mice running away, the making the neuron that's making the mice wanting to eat more. Mm -hmm. um, and then so my specific field work done in my lab are uh, looking at reproductive related behavior like you know parental care like caring for your pups and then also mating behaviors mm -hmm. so those behaviors w are what we call sexually dimorphic meaning they're different between males and females so one major finding is that you know when we stimulate in the brain we can make the males behave like females or females behave like males. So it's sort of counterintuitive what I told you just now about the heart wiring. Mm -hmm. Yet, um, even though it's heart wired, there are potential. So the males, it does have the female circuitry we call to, to behave like a female, but those circuitry are dormant. It's mm -hmm. not being active. It's like it has the computer program to behave like female, but those programs are not normally being engaged. So you're rewiring it? Yes, yes. so I can now like, short circuit it and then sort of engage those wiring program to see the behaviors. That's quite a power, that's quite a, quite a daunting power potentially. What's the ultimate use of that from a sort of human perspective? Yes, uh, so one study about innate behavior is that, you know, even though we think of us as like really intelligent, right, through years of our evolution, but we carry our uh, evolution baggage with us. A lot of our behavior, whether we want to um, admit it or not, are still hardwired. I think um, the useness of studying innate behavior is to understand the evolution history of us say in the wild it's hard to get really uh, yummy food mm -hmm. so when you see yummy food you really want to pack it up on it you want yeah. to eat right because you might not There's see it trigger. again there yes again. but then you know in modern society that's not good because there are just too many 
yeah, then, yes. yeah. so you you don't want that part so now if you understand why we want to eat yummy food maybe we can like rewire the circuit and make you more resistant to it well so this is what i was going to ask that's a natural next question does it mean we can re rewire people animals in this case initially but people not to feel traumatized by something not to feel afraid of something because that is a huge control element and therefore raises massive sort of um, ethical question i would say um we can uh both when we take drugs like you know those anti-psychiatric -psych drugs mm. part of it is actually doing this like uh, pharmacological rewiring I'm not talking about mind control but when we have like say treat uh people with like behavior therapies mm. we're giving instructions somewhat to rewire to think about it, to frame it different to think about it differently the power of control your innate impulses lies in that we have this uh, cortical control we have mm. this prefrontal cortex that you know um, even to recognize the impulse but don't act on it is where this uh, power of uh, rewiring or control um, sort of coming to, I think, yeah. So is the brain then still kind of like deep oceans, like outer space? Is it still one of those great sort of unknown areas of human exploration? Definitely, definitely. This is the universe with, within, you know, our uh, skull. Because there are like, um, if I get the numbers right, like 80 billions of neurons, and each neuron can make thousands of contact with other neurons. Mm. If you imagine it, it's like, there are like only 8 billion human beings on Earth. Imagine the human sort of uh, network. And you have, a, within our, every single one of us, the brain's connection are much more complex than just the, the entire human race's connection. And then to, to see that, you know, and that's what gives us our thoughts, right? Our individual sort of personality. Mm -hmm. But it also might go wrong and give you some sort of a, a you know, disease. So, um, just, uh, and, and it's also the scale, right? You know, so, so you have neurons, and then you have like brain area, and then you have neural networks, and then you have interperson, like this one universe interacting with another universe, sort of. So it's like really complex. And we're at the foothills of this in terms of that exploration. We're at the very early stages of it, do you think? Yes, in definitely. Very, very early. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like the, the medieval early, yeah. <laughs> medieval early, that's, yes, a, that's yes. early. One thing I was going to ask you, obviously, I mentioned earlier on that we're here at the um, ICT annual competition final for Huawei, and you've been on a panel, Women in Tech. How important is it that we are getting, encouraging um, more women into technology like yourself? I think it is very important. And I think the importance lies in that women may have a different perspective than men. Um, you know, the human history was written mostly by men. Because it's so complex, to look at it from very different angles mm -hmm. would allow you to maybe answer the question better. And I think, you know, another point I want to make is that women in general, maybe I'm biased, are more team workers. Mm -hmm. They tend to work better as teams. And I've just said, like, you know, we have this, like, puzzle that requires a lot of coordination to really crack it. So I think more women in might making this teamwork. More of a collaborative Yes, approach. yes, and then you can push it forward. Just in general, yeah, I think it, it, it would help, yeah. And so what can businesses like Huawei do to, to foster that? Huawei is a really famous sort of like flagship like company. And like, I think people, it can set a standard mm. for other companies. Like when we talked this morning about life and work, you have to blend it in a way mm -hmm. that uh, to make uh, the female workers or employees like more um, sort of can balance better. Yeah, so I think it can set the standard, and, and once they set the standard, not at its cost, actually be more productive, then people will follow. So that's what I uh, hope to see. Hopefully, you know, in the future, yeah.